I like that. Wait a minute. We're on the south side of Chicago, so let's give ourselves a round of applause. That's way better. My name is uh, Chef Cliff Rome. I am the proprietor of a company called Rome's Joy Companies. It's comprised of Peach's Restaurant, so if you have not been here, make sure you come back. That's right. Some discount coupons there uh, on the seat, so make sure you come back and use those. We also own a facility called Blanc Gallery. Actually, we have another Chicago Humanities uh, event going on right now. Uh, we own the Parkway Ballroom, which is a historic uh, event facility at the corner of 45th and King Drive. And lastly, Rome's Joy Catering, which is the food and beverage component to that. So I am glad that you guys are here in Chicago on the south side. Not a wintry night, but a cool night in Chicago. We're here to talk about food. Adarina and I have had a conversation before a little bit about food and its culture and, and the combination of um, what it means historically um, to our families, to our um, people who are food enthusiasts or, or just people in general who just enjoy everything, right, about food. So I'm glad you guys have come to the south side of Chicago, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Adarina. So Adarina is the founder of a, of a company called Sirius Ki a Syrian Kitchen. As a part of Chicago-based interactive cooking project, Adarina hosts a popular cooking class with a seriologist, right? Oh, wow, look at that. From the <laughs> University of Chicago to share about 6,000 years of Assyrian history and culinary tradition in the culinary world with her students. So without further ado, we have Adarina. Give me a big round of applause, please. Thank you, Chef Cliff. It is truly a pleasure and a joy, a Rome's joy, to be here tonight. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who made it out this evening um, to share this evening with us, because it'll be a great dialogue about food, about family, and love. So truly appreciate you all coming out tonight. Thank you. So act like you guys are at home, because we're going to have our little conversation, so you can chime in if you want to. So when we start talking about um, Assyrian food, talk about Assyria. What is Assyria and where is it at? The million dollar question. So what is Assyria? Is it like Syria? Where are you from? Um, first, I'll start with my name. Is it Atarina? Is it Atornia? So my name is Aturina and it means, um, it basically means uh, Ashur, Assyrian um, from the word Ashur, from the god Ashur. And um, Assyrians are the indigenous people of where modern day Iraq is today. The empire was pretty vast. Um, countries like Syria, Iran, empire collapsed 612 BC. And because of that, and since then, you know, the, the culture and the language is still alive. And you have Assyrians all over the world living in diaspora. So Assyrians are, you, you could have Assyrians in Syria. Um, the language is different. It's a mixture of Akkadian and Aramaic. It's still spoken today. I speak, read, and write in Assyrian. Um, born and raised in Chicago, but it was definitely something growing up that my mother and the whole family, you know, asked you to speak. Um, otherwise, you'd see a wooden spoon chasing you. <laughs> but it was great because you learn speaking, you know, more than one language, and it's just, um, it's another pathway into the culture. So Assyrians are the indigenous people of where Iraq is today. What's a Syrian kitchen? A Syrian kitchen um, is a concept that, um, that started seven years ago, and it was out of pure curiosity. Growing up, uh, you would, you'd watch grandma cook, you'd, you'd, you know, you'd, you would be in the kitchen with mom, but as you get older, and it, you know, you, you look back and you're like, oh, I should have spent more time, I should have asked more questions, but it, you, you don't. And then you grow up and you work, and I'm sure a lot of folks in the room understand where I'm coming from, you want to document those recipes, and calling an elder or calling mom usually doesn't help because it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and how can you make a dish that way? But um, you do. And so that's when I started having more conversations with my mom, who's still en route to Peaches right now. Yeah. <laughs> She's stuck in She's traffic. on her way. She called. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so what's great is that a Syrian kitchen started off as cooking classes, and I partnered with Whole Foods, and then eventually the Oriental Institute. And I actually would like to give a quick shout out to a friend and a colleague who's in the audience today, Dr. Oya, who's a lecturer at Northwestern. And she and I met through the program at the OI. Um, she actually brought her class out here. Most, the survivors, right? They were, <laughs> round of applause for them because most of their class was 
hit with the stomach bug this evening and couldn't make it out, so thank you for coming out. And because of Assyrian Kitchen, I've been able to bridge these relationships with various folks um, in, in ed educational institutions to talk about the culture, to talk about the food, and really, it was just simple curiosity. Um, I also wanted to share the love and the passion that you feel when you are in an Assyrian home. Tea's always on. You don't have to call, you just show up. There's always food. I feel like sometimes you're being attacked by food because there's you know, um, a platter of walnuts and dates and figs. There's food. You can't leave an Assyrian household without being stuffed, really, like a dolma. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it's just part of the food culture. It's the, it's the love, it's the warmth, it's the generosity. And I wanted to, so I was learning and I was sharing and basically collaborating with various chefs in the Chicagoland area to, to talk about the Assyrian cuisine. And then on that journey, I realized, wow, there are so many dishes that haven't changed. I came across the Yale tablets. They're housed in Yale University. Um, and these are tablets, three tablets, 40 recipes. Pr pretty ancient, right? And then I started realizing the commonalities between what we're still you know, enjoying today as modern day Assyrian cuisine and um, how the ancient Assyrians ate, true foodies, really, um, and bridging that connection. And I was fascinated. I'm like, wow, there's more to this. It's not just learning how to make um, harissa, which is barley and chicken, nice porridge uh, texture, um, other dishes that we'll talk about in a little bit. But it was just, it, it was just um, unearthing like all these treasures about Assyrian cuisine. So when we talked before, we were saying how the relationship is, you mentioned your grandmother, right? I grew up on the south side of Chicago with my grandmother in the kitchen. So the similarities are very similar, right? How has it been different cooking here in Chicago and just like understanding exactly what food means and the historical significance of, of the type of cuisine that you prepare? When you start to think about it, let me ask a different question. Where could you go and get Assyrian food right now? My house. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody um, go. <laughs> so what's interesting is that Assyrian cuisine, the way the traditional, the traditional dishes that you would have at an Assyrian home aren't really at, an, at a restaurant today. Um, you'll have Middle Eastern food, but let's talk about some of those dishes, okay? Um, what you enjoyed this evening, and what we, we still have some more, um, you have gubbe bate, which is kubba. No, no, say that again. So how many people got that? Yeah. Say that again. Gubbe bate, right? So, and there, you, you've probably heard it as kubba, kibbe, um, various names. And it's cracked wheat, so some of the ingredients that we still use in, in modern, um, mo modern Assyrian cuisine, very common back then. So the bulgur, the cracked wheat, um, the, obviously the filling, uh, the darker ones have meat, the ones that are in rice, again, rice wasn't an ancient grain, but over time, right. um, we've, we've adopted that into our, in, into our um, modern dishes. Um, but what's fascinating is that, you know, the cucumber, the parsley, Onions, leek, garlic. So onions, leek, garlic, right? Pretty much in every recipe. This, and I'll read a few recipes a little bit later, but it was a standard. It's a staple in, in most of the dishes. Um, and so where can you go today? Right now, um, there are certain re restaurants that are inspired. I'll mention one, Zaytun Mediterranean Grill. Chef Dan Sarkis, who actually made the, the kibbeh this evening, is a place that's inspired, the menu's inspired with Assyrian dishes. There's Larsa's in Skokie. That's another one. Um, but coming, and, and it's going to be a plug. Sorry, chef. But <laughs> Shabesha. So this is, this is where it's coming in. So Shabesha means come home in Assyrian. And this is a pop-up concept that's coming to Chicago in December. And it, we will be serving um, traditional Assyrian fare. So these are dishes that are on the tablets that we talked about. Um, and they'll be recreated. Hello. I know, I know the phone is ringing. I'm like, what? <laughs> Who's calling? Mom, are you on your way? Um, so, and so Shabesha is a place where you'll come home to have ancient Assyrian dishes that you really can't get anywhere unless you come into, you know, the heart and the home of an Assyrian person. Does that? So, yeah, yeah. So, because, like, in, at my grandmother's house, between my grandmother and my aunt, we used to go for Sunday dinners, yeah. a.k.a. soul food, right? And so is that a time where everyone gets together? Because it wasn't fancy food. It's all no, good food, right? Good food. So it's not necessarily a three-star Michelin dining, mm -hmm. 
but it's great food oh, that yes. should be, yes. right? So when, when you get together, is it that, that same concept of everyone getting in yes. the kitchen, rolling up your sleeves and... Yes, so when you and I first talked about this, we connected immediately, Chef, because it was, um, it was that. And that's, that's, that's the joy, again, that's the pleasure of sharing food because it is an, interna an international language of connecting with, with people. And that's what you always see at these cooking classes because there are, um, we're so similar and I don't think we realize that every right. day. I mean, it's just so fascinating. Going back to like the experiences we had, and, and cousin John and his wife Carmen, the audience tonight, you know, they remember growing up. John does not Carmen, but growing up at my grandmother's uh, house every Sunday, it was a meal. Right. People would come over. Again, no one called. You just showed up, and that was how my grandmother showed her love. And um, it was again nothing fancy. Presentation was nice, but it was just good food, and it was really made from the heart. And I think that's, uh, growing up again, we talked about how our grandmothers were in the kitchen pretty much the entire day um, with General Hospital sort of in the background at my grandmother's <laughs> kitchen. But I mean, she spent the entire day in the kitchen. And I think, you know, growing up seeing that, you always wondered like, what is she making? And then once right. you sat down to enjoy it, you're like, ah. It's incredible. Yeah. Wait, did your grandmother do like my grandmother though? She would say, go pick that up, and then you turn around. She put something in there, and yes, then you turn around, because you, no. you could never get the food exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah, and, everyone does that. And they, You all know what I'm talking about, yes. right? And they would call us in sometimes to, like, wrap things. It was just, like, the finishing touches. It wasn't really being part of the entire experience. And, you know, that, that would pay, I guess I would... Go, if I had to go back and tell my younger self, I would probably tell myself to like listen more and pay attention more because that's where everything was happening. And so that was just fascinating. And um, that connection that we had when we first talked about it was just, it's like, see, we're so much alike. And that, and, and those ideas and those feelings, and it's nostalgic. Um, we made, we're making uh, kipte, which is, which is meat with, with cracked wheat. Um, Sometimes you, you stuff it with, with an egg. And there was a gentleman in the class, uh, Romanian background, and he said, well, in Romania, we make something very similar, but we put feta cheese inside. And I'm like, brilliant. OK, so see, from that, you get other ideas, and you find out how, how, how similar we are, how connected we are. Right. And through that, there's a bond that's created. And that's why a Syrian kitchen, to me, you know, it started off with just simple curiosity. And then from that, it was just, wow, there's so much more to it. So you're working on these different projects. Tell us a little bit about this project you're doing with Yale. Okay, so um, the, the tablets are pretty much um, a, a gateway into these, these recipes. Again, it's, it's, it's tying it back and making you know, the ancient new again, is the way I like to see it. Um, let's talk about the recipes, right? There, when traditional Assyrian cuisine, right, has a lot of broths, a lot of stews, and when you read these recipes, these, were, these recipes were created for skilled chefs that were in, um, in, in like part of, the, part of the, um, the king's court. And so they were skilled. When you read these recipes today that have been translated um, by uh, Botero and, and others, they're missing a lot of instructions. So when you read them, you have to basically interpret a lot of, you know, how to, how to assemble some of these dishes. Assyrians had a great practice of recording pretty much everything and anything that they did, which is fascinating because, you know, thank you for doing that. Now we have this, you know, sort of uh, insight into what they were eating. Um, and I'll read, I'll read a quick recipe for you just to give you an example of how, you know, these dishes are being interpreted. And remember I talked about the onions and the leek. I mean, they loved their onions and leek. And today that's part of like the garnish that we serve at the table with pretty much everything. Um, and they are basically um, uh, the base for most of our dishes. So here's one. It says, one of the simplest recipes. It's meat broth. Take some meat. Get the water ready. Add some fat. There's some text that's missing, right? <laughs> then there's leek and garlic pounded together. And plain shuhitnu. Okay, and there, there's another one. It's called a red broth. No meat necessary. And actually, meat wasn't part of uh, every dish that they had. There were a lot of vegetarian options back then. Um, and it was a, a, a great you know, deal of their diet was, it consisted of veg veggies. Uh, it says, get the water ready, add fat, pluck the heart, liver, and lungs, tripe and belly, salt, cracked malt, onions, cumin, coriander, leek, pound together before putting on the flame, in a cooking pot, the meat will have been steeped in the blood set aside uh, from the animal sacrificed for this dish. 
So. I, I promise you that's one of my recipes. Yeah. It sounds just like it. <laughs> but what was interesting is that uh, Botero's like keen analysis of like these res these tablets, these three ta these three tablets, forty recipes, was that the uh, ancient Assyrians had really um, they they had advanced techniques. So they weren't just roasting and um, grilling. They were actually placing the meat and the fowl, the vegetables, all in, in, a, in a liquid. So whether it was in water or a, another type of liquid. So it was more advanced than what you would expect ancient people to be eating. And so when he was actually going through these tablets and um, translating them, he realized that. And so that's why I always refer to the ancient Assyrians as those ancient foodies, because they, it wasn't just here's the meat, you know, and, and, and just cook it, there right. was more to that. You couldn't go to the butcher shop and get like a nice cut back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> right, not like that. Yes. What is the approximate date of this tablet? 1700 BC. Mm -hmm. So is your work with the University of Chicago very similar to that? Yes. So the University of Chicago, um, we've had several uh, programs. The most recent one is the Ancient Cooking Series. We actually have a sold out class tomorrow. Um, and our, our focus is on another ancient recipe. Uh, many of you have probably seen meat pie, uh, Middle Eastern meat pies. So it's dough with ground meat, onions, parsley. Well, that was an ancient recipe, again, found in these tablets. Um, and that's what we'll be making tomorrow. We're also going to, going to be talking about fermentation and um, pickling. So Assyrians preserved pretty much everything and anything, right? Their way of... Uh, preserving, right? right. Underground. Yeah. And they would seal it with, with, um, with, with wax. And um, Oya, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, they would also put like the family, um, the family stamp so that they would know when they would unearth it, um, who it belonged to. But that was the way they preserved um, food and other objects. Wait a minute, what if everyone's last name began with A? Oh, that's a problem then. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. Well, it was a seal. It was a family seal and they realized, okay. you know, how they... So, wait, we talked about this. Was it, did your grandmother try to do it when she came to yes. America? Segue to the cheese. So, the buried cheese, very good. So, well, she did try to do that with the cheese. So, cheese was another thing that they were able to find, uh, the residue in these clay pots that they were able to unearth. And that was another, so, different types of dairy, cheese being one of them. Um, buried cheese is actually a family recipe. My grandmother's, when she came to Chicago, right, from, and, and, from Baghdad, they um, of course brought lots of recipes and, every, and, and traditions with them, one of them being burying cheese underground. And so back home, back in, in Iraq, they were able to do that. Um, it was cheese in a clay pot just like this, maybe bigger, and um, they'd bury it underground to ferment it, and then they would enjoy it over the winter months. So she tried to do the same thing when she came here, it didn't go so well. And so <laughs> I've actually, so a lot of people post um, other Assyrian families that have come here, and these are second, third generations. They're like, oh, I remember that. It's that, sometimes they refer to it as that stinky cheese, but that's when it's actually aging, right? It's not stinky. My, my cheese isn't stinky. My grandmother's cheese wasn't stinky. But what's interesting is that um, they would bury it in, you know, their backyards here in Chicago, and sometimes they wouldn't find it. So... <laughs> I've heard stories where people post, they're like, oh, we should go back to like grandma's, you know, old building and find out like where that cheese jar is. It's aged cheese for it's real. Really all right. aged, yeah. So buried cheese was um, a product I launched last year, actually on my grandmother's birthday on the 17th. So it'll be year the 17th. And this was something that she always made. And again, you, you grow up enjoying this. I never realized it was that cool until like, you know, you get older and you're like, oh, wow. Right. This is something that other people will like because, you know, it's not fancy when it's in the refrigerator and you're like, oh, here's some cheese. And you enjoy it, breakfast, lunch, dinner in the summertime with watermelon and it's really good with warm, you know, flatbread, pita bread. It's delicious. Um, and then you grow up and you're like, wow, this would be, this is a unique product and something that, you know, others may enjoy, might enjoy. And it's been great. So berry cheese is. Are there any other, like, um, dishes? As a kid, you hate it, but then no, like you I love, love now. Food. <laughs> 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 but was no, but right seriously, like like oh. as a kid, I hated Brussels sprouts. Oh. Uh, maybe pacha, which is like tr stuffed, it's tripe stuffed intestines. Um, you know, just the smell of that sometimes wasn't you know that. It yeah. wasn't my favorite dish. But then again, you grow up and you're like, oh wow, that's actually not bad. Right. 
So maybe that would be one. When you start to think about, like, some, because we, we're having a conversation, um, the chefs and I were having a conversation earlier today. We started to think about all those things as a kid, I yeah. remember. So in New Orleans, it was boudin, right? Mm -hmm. So you had a blood sausage. When I come to Chicago, it's hoghead cheese. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, I hated it as a kid. I still hate it now. Okay. But as a kid, it was like, it was terrible. Yeah. But now I'm starting to see more and more chefs at these um, fine dining restaurants and, and just casual dining starting to incorporate mm -hmm. more of those uh, authentic, Sure. Uh, you know, dishes on a regular basis. So is that kind of the direction you'd like to see the, the yes. food go? Yes, or? Um, definitely, because there are dishes, again. Um, it, for, I think, the, the, it's slow food, so it takes a while to prepare some of these dishes. Right. One of the things that we like to do when we're, um, when we're hosting our cooking classes is we show the traditional way of making it, but then for somebody who's, you know, a professional working doesn't have all that time there are other ways to make it but it's bringing back some dishes that um, that you don't typically eat you might have them for the holidays that's pretty much it but that's what we're trying to bring back with Shabesh and having that on the on the menu so that you could enjoy it in a, in a different way and I think it's that nostalgia that that connects us back to it because you're like I didn't like but now when you when you have a dish that you didn't like as a kid growing up um, there's a connection and that's that's the part and I usually get this from it's a feedback that I get from um, from our followers and people that come out to our classes. They feel a connection. So maybe it's a dish that they haven't had in a long time, but now they're able to um, either see pictures of it, come to a class, learn how to make it, and it's bringing that back on you know, and, and tying it back to these ancient recipes. Uh, again, that's what's fascinating because not a lot has changed. So you you a foodie at heart? Yes. But what do you do during the day? Um, uh, so, backgrounds in technology, um, marketing, um, th but this is what keeps me sane, honestly, because this is where <laughs> my passion is, and, um, you know, eventually it's going to be moving away from that world, um, and then just focusing in on this, because, again, this is what excites me every day, and it's connecting with people. That's the, that's the basis of it, I think. Um, you can, all of us can sit around a table and have a meal together and there's, and I know that this is something that's very, um, it's clear to see for, for, for those of us that are always working with people, but it's just an amazing bond. And you see that in the cooking classes, you see it in the demos that we have and collaborating with the various institutions. So um, I think that's, that's the part that keeps it real and keeps us smiling, I think, and connecting us. Because um, you're not it. forcing it. You're right. not forcing it. It's real. Anytime yeah. you do that, I mean, and that's part of the thing that I think we love the most about um, the food industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Cooking is relaxing. When it you is. get in there, you see people who actually enjoy what they do. It doesn't feel like work. Exactly. So this is probably this why is the next chapter is going to yes. be, you know, you're not doing tech, you're doing yes. more cooking. Yes. Is there a go-to spice? Like you have to have it? If I go in your cabinet right now, you always have this? So all spice for sure. Um, that's one. Um, then you have cumin. That's definitely. And again, the spices made their way through the trade and eventually made it into, um, you know, our dishes. But you know, cumin being one that's definitely in in the ancient recipes, coriander. Um, so these are these are must. And then garlic and onions always. Um, and you, again, you have like just you slice up onions and you, you have parsley and leeks, and that's part of anything that you have. And today, some of those grains that were Let's let, cracked wheat, so, um, barley. Um, they're still part of the cuisine today, but you'll see more rice with the stews that we make. Right. Again, that made its way through, but um, that's just that's the core of it. Um, and the and and we talk about the types of meat. So lamb, definitely part of the cuisine. Um, fish. So eight, smoked fish. That was. That was definitely common as an ancient right. um, recipe, and that's another thing that we're trying to bring back. So it's just, again, the Middle East is just so vibrant. There's so many different cultures, and the, the point of telling the Assyrian kitchen story is just to show that there are commonalities and there are some differences, and we're celebrating all of that. So when you start to think about the spices that are very indigenous, mm -hmm. um, I think about the Caribbean, mm. right? some of the same things you mentioned. So when you start to think of curry, allspice, mm -hmm. you know, rice with dishes, you know, you can't help but to start to think about all these other places and see how we talk about those similarities. So, yes. so between food and music, those are the things that kind of tie everything together. Yes, and it's such a simple way to connect that to me it's a no-brainer because 
it just it's a it's a very simple way um, to, to bring us together and I think you know based on that idea very simple right um, but it's grown into something really beautiful that you know I cherish every day and I'm sure and grateful for these opportunities too because we still we, we just keep making the connections what's the ultimate goal ultimate goal is to continue just sharing um, you know to me it's really like showing how 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 close we are because you, you start seeing that the m more we have these conversations. I mean, within the first few minutes, you told me about your grandmother. I talked about mine. I felt like they were related. You know? I think we're cousins. <laughs> we are cousins. I, I really do. We've been saying that. We've been <laughs> we, saying that. Yeah. And so to me, it's just continue making these connections and, sh and just raising that awareness, sharing that love. I know it sounds kind of, you know, it's just, it, 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 it's, it's what we're all sort of like looking for. But through food, it's just so easy. And it's sharing the food culture. Um, because there's more tied with it. There's the traditions, and so there's more than just the food. It's the experience around it that really connects us. If, if you had to walk us through a dish right now, mm -hmm. that'll be like an easy dish to make. Okay. But if you guys close your eyes and think about it while mm. she's talking, yeah. <laughs> what would that dish, dish be? Let me ask John. John, one of your favorite dishes, and then I'll walk him through it. Growing up, <laughs> put him on the spot. So I'll, I'll do this. It's a variation of like the, the kibbas that we had um, this evening. So you can have them in, in a stew. Um, again, imagine cracked wheat, wheat and then with um, the, the meat filling, but then now it's in a stew. It's like a great like winter dish. It's comfort food. Um, you have that, there's turnips in there. Just the flavors of it, I mean, I can taste it right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the kuppa was very, I mean, very popular, but in different formats. And so that's one in a stew that's just amazing. Um, a lot of our food is comfort food. I mean, this one was fried today, right? But, you know, even like the boiled kibbe, amazing. I mean, it's just, these are the go-to foods. So for the holidays, for Thanksgiving and other holidays, you'll have the traditional, you know, turkey spread with all the, all, all the side dishes. But if you don't have the kuppe, the burek, which is an Assyrian egg roll, something's wrong. So it's like, you know, everyone's looking around. It's like, where's the other table with all that other stuff that we're going to have with the turkey? That's when they start whispering. Yeah. Who is that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why don't we make any budeks? Um, so, and then you'll see across the Middle East, so there's like, you know, similar, even with the meat pies that I talked about earlier, um, across various cultures, different spices, maybe a little different, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's very, it's very similar. It's just that Assyrian cuisine, what I'd like to see is, you know, making sure that it, it is understood because it's not your typical falafel or a kebab with rice. There's more to it. And that's what we want to explore and share. So when we, we talked a little bit about the tablets, right? Mm -hmm. So tying the tablets into today's traditional cooking methods, how, mm -hmm. what's the link? Oh, it's, it's, the link is pretty like loud and it's 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 strong because, um, like I said, a lot of the recipes that you'll see in the tablets have a lot to do with the stews or the broths, and that's just like the base for a lot of the dishes we make. Uh, one with lamb and chickpeas and onions, really simple. You add water and you just boil it until it's nice and tender. You can enjoy it with you know flatbread and a side of dish with like parsley and onions again. That was on the menu back then. And here we are today, right. still enjoying it. So when I saw that, I'm like, wow, this needs, I mean, Batero, thank you. And it's like, now it's just continuing this and just bringing it back to life because it's, it's real to me. I, I, I've been sort of eating this and enjoying this and knowing this, but I didn't know that there was so much attention on this. And now these cool tablets to kind of support it. I, I just think it's fascinating. I don't, I mean, it I'm is. trying to contain myself because <laughs> I can get super excited about this. <laughs> do you do a lot of um, thinking about the, the cuisine when you're doing the actual classes? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's, what's the goal, to, the, the takeaway actually from the class? It's the techniques. It's talking about, you know, um, fermentation and how that comes into play. Like, I think every Syrian household has, you know, their own batch of yogurt that they make at home that's important because it's, again, the base for some of our, m most of our dishes. So having homemade yogurt... Um, is important. Pickling vegetables, important. Um, th those are some of the things that you'll always find in a Syrian home. So 
you know, sharing that and just sharing the very simple methods that they used back then and with, with folks today to kind of keep that simple way of, it's, it, is, it is healthy cooking, aside from like the fried kibbit. It, well, they're not so bad, but you know, aside from that. I was gonna ask that, like, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Aside from that, but like for the most part, it's, you know, it's the grains. It's, you know, with a, a portion of like a meat. But that's pretty light. And then it's the vegetables and the parsley and, and the chickpeas and the fava beans. So those are all in dishes today. So the tablets are, you know, a, a huge piece of that. And it's just another, you know. And is it typically broken down into courses or do you just, you know, you today? lay it out like a oh, smorgasbord of it's, you know, great you, cuisine? It is. It's just um, back then it was platters. They And they didn't have actual, like an actual place where they would go in and dine. So it's like wherever they're actually having the meal. Um, and then it would be the platters that they would bring out with the different types of foods. And of course, it, de it varied for people that were in the king's court versus people, common day folk that were having, it was, it was different. And so I think that's what's, again, fascinating because today when you um, have the spread, it is pretty much everything's out on the table, but presented in a very nice way too. So they were actually, even the ancient Assyrians had, this is another thing that Botero noticed was that at the end, so bef the, because of the techniques and the recipes and how they brought everything together, he considered it to be a grand cuisine, um, but the presentation that they used and how they presented everything, it had, you know, the garnishes, whether it was fresh greens, garlic, chicken, gizzards, bird feathers, but the way that it was presented was also important for them. So he, he, he talks about that, and, and I think that's pretty amazing. Um, I think my mom's in the room now, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere back there, and for her, presentation is key. Um, I think she is. No, she's probably not here. Well, it's okay. She'll watch it later. But I mean, for her, presentation is so important. And how? Oh yeah. It's like she, no, you can't just let it go out there like that. You have to. She, is she back there with the apron oh, on, wiping the oh, plates yeah. before it she's goes out? She's the teacher behind a Syrian kitchen, really. Like, and so for her, you know, it's always going back and and um, making sure that we're getting the recipes right. And so it's. Does it, she yell at you? She doesn't yell at me anymore, but, <laughs> but, but she's funny. So, you know, when I first started making yogurt, she didn't need a thermometer to check the temperature and she would use the simple like finger test. Oh yeah. Oh, there she is. Oh, she's coming in. So yeah, she's like, oh, it's warm enough and now it's cool enough. Now we can incubate it. And I'm like, ma, how do you know? She's like, I know. And I'm like, okay, I can't do that yet, but I'll know too one day. So it's just, um, you know, learning from somebody who, who's been in the kitchen, who's an expert, who has the passion. There's mom. Hey. <laughs> hey, hey, mommy, we were just talking about you. It was great stories, though. <laughs> great way to put mom on the spot there. <laughs> but no, she's awesome. So um, yeah, and I think that that, you know, the presentation piece is another thing to note because it's important uh, in how you serve that, uh, how you serve your meals for the people that you love. And then that's how you find the connection again between the food, the family, and the generosity in the culture that you want to share. And trust me, when you walk into an Assyrian home, and I think this is probably similar across all cultures, um, you know, it's that hospitality, it's that generosity of like love and food that you just want to share so you don't want to leave. I mean, growing up, my friends never, never wanted to leave because it was just always a great meal and they got to connect. And honestly, we were always in the kitchen. Right. So that's Oh, well, that's just, always the host. That's always, right? You go to anyone's house and they're cooking, it, oh. except for this is what I don't like. When everyone's asking you, when you're behind and yes. you're kind of playing like, smooth, you all know that. Yes. You're running behind, you're sweating a little bit, mm -hmm. something didn't come in, yes. somebody forgot to pick up something else, yes. and then you're just smiling, and <laughs> you want I've everybody to turn that. around. Yeah, and then I'm like, can somebody like get aunt so-and-so out right. of you know, Give her a glass of wine. <laughs> Give her a glass of wine. Yeah, so I think that that's the part that's just, you know, again, it, it's, it's simple emotions that we all share, but be, they become so real in the kitchen. We, we talked about culture and, and growing up. So when your friends came to the house mm -hmm. and they smelled the food. Oh, yeah. And some wanted to eat and some didn't. Was it offensive? Oh, yes. You have to eat. Like, you cannot leave unless you eat. I mean, that was so no, no, common. No, no, I just ate. I just yeah, ate. No, 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 no. no. None gonna, of that. You're going to eat. Yeah, because it's an insult if you, like, reject, the, you know, the cook. And it, it's usually the mom and, or the grandma. <laughs> you, you don't say no to Nana because she would get really mad. And so, sorry, I haven't been looking back this way. But it's just that, you know, so it was very important for, for people to, um, to feel that. Again, it's, it's just an extension of, like, the love that they want to show you. It's through the food because they've, spe they've spent all day in the kitchen preparing it for you. 
So right, but just like just in general though, they they're cooking, right? Yeah. So it wouldn't be just like for me <laughs> if yeah, I didn't eat it. It's yeah, like, well, yeah. I, I'd feel horrible and yes, you try it. Yes, you don't say no. You wouldn't no, you wouldn't you wouldn't really survive my grandmother, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there was no no. <laughs> yeah. Is it that you think Assyrian food stayed true to the t tradition that mm -hmm. came from 1700 BC mm -hmm. when the Assyrian people were moved around to so many different places? Yeah, great question. So I think that um, when when you're sort of just running and tra and just basically trying to you know stay alive in that part of the world, and then um, just you, there are a few things that you can hold on to. It's the it's your food, it's the language, um, and so th those are the things that I think allowed the Assyrian people even today, whether you're here, you're in Iraq, you're in Australia, you're still preparing these foods because it's just, again, you're trying to keep that culture alive. Um, there are some, you know, changes or variations that have happened as they naturally would, but um, I think that's, that's, a, that's, the, that's the reason why. Because language, even, even today, it's a challenge because as, you know, Gen over time and ver you know generations, it's it's difficult to, to maintain it. But food still. I mean, I had that conversation with with Robert. Just met him today, actually, and um, we talked about you know he's a Syrian, and we talked about the food and how that's still a connection. We were able to connect on that. Not so much the language, but it's just like the food was that bonding moment for us. And I think when you're traveling and just trying to stay alive, that's what brings home back here, right? Whether you're in Chicago or in Baghdad still, right? Does that answer your question? Yes. Um, so, oh yeah, I'm gonna turn to you. For utensils, so there were utensils that were used, but some, most of this food was, was finger food, but um, there were utensils, but in the shape of spoons, correct? Spoons. So that's what they used. So they did use them. It's just that um, they still, you know, relied on a lot of these foods, whether it was pickled or if it was, you know, the meats they, they enjoyed with their hands. <clears throat> Do you think that the Assyrian foods that you're trying to promote and so on, uh, have they been Americanized the way something like, for instance, chop suey? which of course no Chinese person in the world would recognize this. They wouldn't even think it was the same thing. But it happens and as assimilation occurs, mm -hmm. are, are there things that we could look along those lines yes. that might be a little more to our tastes or yes. something? Um, so I think one thing that comes to mind is the egg rolls, the Assyrian egg rolls. Like sometimes um, we see this um, just because of convenience, people will use like the, the wonton wrappers to, to, to make the, the Assyrian egg rolls, but before they were actually made from actual, you know, um, dough that was, was made. So that's like one variation of it. Um, it's a nice, you know, um, cross between cultures there. Um, potato chop, gosh, what do they call it? There's the, the potato chop, right? Yes, and so it's like, it's potatoes, and there's ground meat, and I think that was something that was picked up with Assyrians that made their way to the UK, um, and it's a dish that they experienced there, but now it's become part of our modern day cuisine. So that's another example of something. Um, and the chop might come from the sound of like actually making it, so they call it the potato chop, but that's another example. Yes? Thank you. Going back to the ingredients you were discussing in the recipes, were they all locally sourced or were there trade routes that that really produced the spices and the other ingredients that made yes. the dishes? Great question. So yeah, through um, like the lower part of modern day Iraq, uh, through the port, they were able to get the spices. So that's where they were able to get, and then that's why, you know, there's all these commonalities across, but you know, they were getting them from, from India, from China and other countries. So that's where it was making their way through into the cuisine. Um, but for, you know, some of the other ingredients that we talked about, you know, they were, they were grown. But I think the spices pretty much. Over time, rice became something that was, you know, sourced in. But again, not so much in the ancient time, but um, over time that was something. And that's why it's a staple in Assyrian cuisine today, rices. Yes? So you are recreating and teaching mm -hmm. My guess is that over the years since then, 
as foods have become available, particularly I'm thinking of New World foods, yes. your potato example, yes. that they became incorporated into, quote, traditional, unquote, yes. um, Iraqi or Syrian foods, uh, is, are there foods that you grew up with as being traditional home foods that did in fact post-date in terms of ingredients 1750 BC, you know, that there were, there were tomatoes in it or there, there oh, were yeah. things, pepper, peppers. Peppers, yeah, you, pep peppers weren't an ancient, no. yeah. P potatoes, mm. I mean, all those, col I don't know whether corn appears or not, but anyway. Yes. So did you, did you grow yes. up with foods that, yeah. Yeah, that were Assyrian they became a Syrian soul. Yes, exactly. But in fact, they weren't. It's a great way of putting it. Yeah, a Syrian and soul, but not really ancient. Uh, and that's happened. I think just like language, right? Reality shapes it, and it changes. Um, Assyrians who moved to um, Iran, to Syria, to Lebanon, they all have been, inf the, the cuisine has been influenced by those countries. So today, if you have an Assyrian from Lebanon making you a dish like kubba, it's a little bit different. The spices are a little bit different, but it's still Assyrian So for them, because that's you know what they know. And so even some of the dishes and the stews that we have with tomato in them, of course, it's just evolved, and that's the way we're eating it today. So we, we try to, you know, just highlight that in the classes to let them know that this is an ancient ingredient, and this isn't. And this is how, over time, it's evolved because of, you know, um, just through, through, you know, life and things changing and, and living in different parts of the world. So, but that's still fascinating because there's a story behind that, and that's, again, there's so much to learn you know, from the various recipes, you know. I, I can probably write a book about all the different types of kibbe because it's just, it's, it's extensive and from different parts of the, different parts of the world. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all about kibbe. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, We're right here. Hey, hi. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, so on that note, um, depending on where the food is made. Now I'm sort of wondering about ingredients, and I don't know if this is the right term, but people talk about like terroir. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you made the same exact dish with the same ingredients in Iraq right now, different. and you made it with American ingredients, yeah. would it taste different? Yeah, it would be different. Yeah, for, for various reasons. It's just, you know, the climate, and even, I'm sure, the cheese, like the way my grandmother made the cheese back home, uh, and the way she prepared it, and the way we have to prepare it here, it's totally different. But, you know, um, it's, it's the closest we can come to it, right? Uh, hopefully, when things calm down in that part of the world, I'd love to go back there and be able to still, and then go out into the villages in the northern part of Iraq and then have a traditional Assyrian meal with, with, with people that are still there that haven't left home. Um, because that would be, that would be fascinating. And I'd be able to answer that question because, but I know for a fact, because of just the spices and the, and the food and the way things are prepared here, it's different. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I Am had I? a question about the spectrum of the 40 recipes that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Were they uh, all savory dishes or were they no, there all sweet. appetizers? Yeah. Were they rice dishes? Yeah. Were they dessert uh, Great items? Great question. So um, there were sweet dishes. There were different, there were cakes um, that, you know, mixture of like think uh, dates and figs and nuts kind of put together. And that's a cake that's still made today. Um, they call it the wedding cake, but that's, but there were traditions. So to answer your question, in addition to that, there were ceremonies, right? Dif these different recipes were shared for different types of ceremonies, um, and there was a purpose behind that. They talk about the beer. Beer was a liquid that they used in, in the cooking a lot. Milk was a type of, you know, dairy that they used in, in, the, in the cooking to thicken the you had the stews, you had the savory, you had the sweets, but it was just, um, I wish there were more. And so, but th th that's what you pretty much get from the, and it's a great gateway, again, to, to see what they were thinking and what they were eating. Yes? You get the sense that, um, uh, or could you figure out what a typical meal was like? Or did um, they have a, s a sort of assortment of things that they ate together? Or well, there, did there are recipes? banquets that are They've written about banquets, and um, that, you know, that was pretty much, th I, I, one thing that I did get from that is that they were very generous with, their, with how they shared their food even back then. So from these recipes, they're individual recipes, 
but um, as I continue this journey, you just there's so much more to uh, like uncover. Um, but from the banquet stories that you read about, there was just the, the, it was plentiful, and and there was a lot of that that was shared. And I always wonder if that still that made its way into the culture today, because you don't just put one item on on the dinner table. It is always more than what's needed. And I don't know if that's something that just kind of happened or is that something that was sort of part of the culture and it just kind of carried on? So it's that food culture, I always question, but that's a great question. Hi, this is a fascinating discussion. Could you Thank tell you. me about uh, the population of the Assyrians in Chicago? How big is that? Where, is, where, are, you, where, yeah. is, where are your people? Great. Are they yeah, here, yeah. other places, right? Here's my <laughs> cousin, my cousin. My cousin. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so great question. Um, Chicago is a hub for Assyrians, really. I grew up in the Rogers Park uh, neighborhood, um, and back in the day, um, a lot of Assyrians were, you know, in, in that area. Um, in Chicago today, I, so the last census that we had, I think, you know, we're probably close to like 150,000, I would say, in Chicago. And then next, I would jump to, um, there's a lot of Assyrians in California and San Jose, San Diego. Then you go to Michigan. Uh, and there's been a huge movement out to Arizona in the last like 10 years. Uh, but that's where we are today in the States, Chicago being the first city. And the ancient Assyrians who came here <laughs> were brilliant because it's like, what a beautiful, but the climate, I always wondered about that. You come from a desert, you come to Chicago, like who was that guy or girl that, you know, that made their way out here. But, um, you know, it's just Chicago and Assyrians is um, pretty much synonymous ar around the world. Um, explain, but again, a lot of that, that culture, you have those restaurants, but they've made more of a shift, shift to just like Middle Eastern food. And that's why um, I, when I started this seven years ago, that was the dream. It's like, well, we need a place that actually serves a Syrian food that you would have at someone's home. So can we get that going at some point? And we will soon. Um, but thank you. Great question, thank you. What did you learn from the Yale tablets or from any of the scholars at the Oriental Institute mm -hmm. that changed your perception of what you thought of Assyrian food. I was fascinated because I'm like, when I met, you know, Oya being one and others um, over the years, there were other people fascinated about ancient Assyrians. And I'm thinking, oh, I, like, why am I not so excited? Like, what happened? I mean, because to you, it's just what you know growing up. But then when you start learning from folks and learning how things were preserved and the types of tools and techniques that they, it's just been, I've been grateful for these opportunities because, again, it's, it's a different view into it. I'm sharing what I've known growing up in the culture and what I've learned from, you know, family, my parents, and what I've read, you know, just basically on this journey, but also talking to other people that are just equally fascinated, that just, you know, takes you to another level. And to me, that's what I'm really trying to contain how excited I get. So when we get a one on one conversation going, you'll see it. But yeah, it's just it's it's just natural passion about because to me, again, food is great. But then what happens around that food is even better. And to me, that's, that's the connection. Um, I was wondering if there were any illustrations along with sort of the um, <coughs> Uh, instructions and I was also wondering um, it, I think when you were describing before you were saying that uh, the um, dishes that you found information about were mostly for like the king's court but um, were there any that were for sort of an average meal that a regular person would have yeah <laughs> there were but I think in the tablets pretty much focuses on what was prepared for for the king and 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 his people um, but for the inscription so in the actual tablets it's just uh, cuneiform text on on the recipes although there are other tablets that just depict the the, the ceremonies and what would happen. Um, so from that, I think um, archeologists have been able to gather the story and, and kind of piece it together. Um, but to answer your question, yes, there are depictions, but for the, for the actual tablets, it's just the words. And again, there's some text that's missing or hasn't been translated yet. And 
but based on like the overall like compilation of what they shared, you're able to kind of deduce, okay, this is what they're trying to say and this is what they want you to do. Um, and these dishes have been recreated in other, you know, with, with other institutions who have had, um, what do they call the most recent one? I think it was called like a cuneiform dinner is what they called it. And so that was just, again, a celebration of some of these recipes because again, it's, it wasn't just simple. There was, it was refined for its time and even today. So anyway, I, I just kind of, well, I am a Syrian. But anyway, um, I, I really appreciated your comments about the dropping in at the relatives of my grandmothers. I mean, I, I mean, in this culture today, if you go anywhere without an appointment, you'll be thrown out. And I used to sure. sit there, and I was just, even as a kid, I was kind of marveled at how these people just drop in, and nobody, no, and they yeah. don't even know they're coming. Yes. Yeah, yeah so I, I really did appreciate that. It takes that. you back, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> The other thing I never really appreciated enjoying, because my mother really never cooked the food so much, it was really my grandparents. Um, I never really appreciated the amount of time that it took, I thought, to cook this food. Yes. Um, one thing I really did enjoy in the summertime was uh, she would make mixed, what we call mixed dolma, like mm -hmm. in August when all, everything was, you know, kind of, yes. she had her own garden and everything was kind of fresh. So I've tried to recreate that myself. I've got a book, you know, and I try to follow the directions. The first time I did that, it took me two and a half hours oh, just yeah. to prep everything. Yes, yeah, you're <laughs> right. That's and I, true. And, and I said to my wife, I said, I had no idea <laughs> how much, but you know what? I think she was so good at it, she probably took about 30 minutes or 45, probably. something like that. So anyway, I, I do yeah. appreciate you doing this, and it's really kind of go back. To, it's really kind of wonderful to go back and kind of reminisce. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you for sharing yeah. that, Robert. Because um, to your point, you're right. But I think you know, even the skilled cooks of the house, the grandmas, the moms, it still took them a long time. And and again, we appreciate it now because you know, if once you start making it on your own, you realize, oh wow, this is a lot of work. And what what Robert was describing is you know a variation on the dolma, which is um, so you, many of you have probably had the stuffed grape leaves. Um, he's describing one with different types of vegetables that are also stuffed very similarly. Um, and it's, it's an amazing dish. So you have it with warm bread, some yogurt on the side. Um, the yogurt m could have garlic in it too, and you pour it on top, and it's just amazing. Um, thank you for sharing that. This will be our last question. Could you tell us the story of finding these tablets? I mean, it sounds like they were at Yale for 200 years or something like that, but just that bringing is, them out. Yeah, actually, that's a great question that I'll have to like look into because, yeah, once I found them, I'm like, oh, wow, these are fascinating. Didn't even ask the question of like how they made it there. But to me, it was more about like, this is pretty cool, but um, I'll definitely have a post on the site about that. Yeah, thank you for asking. You guys enjoy yourself? On 